Um, my topic is, uh, that I gave Hans is The Curse of American Exceptionalism. And I'm working on a book on the political economy of war. And, and, and this is something I ran across and that I'm going to include in there. And there's not a lot of economics in what I'm going to have to say today, even though I'm an economist. But I, uh, you know, I keep trying to be more like Murray Rothbard and be interdisciplinary. And so uh, I'm going to talk about American exceptionalism. Now, there, there are at least two different views of this this phenomenon. And one of them uh, basically uh, says that uh, uh, one of the uh, uh, reasons why Americans might be exceptional is that once upon a time, it was a relatively free society compared to many other places in the world. And that allowed a lot of good things to happen, a lot of entrepreneurial innovation, a big civil society, and so forth. But that view of American exceptionalism was long ago eclipsed by a very different view. And the very different view is sort of an imperialistic view, a very arrogant view that Americans are exceptional and uh, that gives them a right to pretty much order other people around, uh, all around the world. There's a bumper sticker in the United States that some libertarians uh, are selling that says, do as we say, or we will bring democracy to your country. And that's, and so, and that view of American exceptionalism is what is what has prevailed for decades now in America. And even if you if you watch American news shows, television shows with the talking heads nowadays, and they're talking about politics, the kiss of death to a, a political aspirant, someone who aspires to get elected to office, is to have one of the the big shot talking heads say, he doesn't believe in American exceptionalism. You're dead meat. You know, you can't, you can't get elected to Congress if, if they say that. And let me give you some examples of this, the rhetoric of American exceptionalism. Abraham Lincoln sort of uh, was one who started this out. He claimed that the US government, <coughs> which essentially meant him, uh, because he, uh, th there are uh, historians, American historians, who are pro-Lincoln historians who call him a dictator, but he was a good dictator, they say. And he's called the U.S. government, quote, the last best hope of Earth. You know, fast forward to Ronald Reagan. He claimed that America is the result of a divine plan to create a shining city on a hill. So he claimed to know what was in the mind of God and he, God told him that he, that he has a divine plan. Uh, Reagan again, into the hand of America, God has placed the destinies of an afflicted mankind. Now, of course, Reagan himself probably didn't write that. It was one of his uh, neoconservative speechwriters who, uh, who, wrote, who wrote this sort of thing. George W. Bush, we have a calling from beyond the stars to stand for freedom. Yeah, uh, yet again, God told me. It was George W. Bush, by the way, when he ran for president, he said he was sitting in church one day and God spoke to him and told him to run for president. He, he actually said that. Bill Clinton, somebody else who talks to God a lot. Uh, the United States is indispensable to the forging of stable political relations in the world. And of course, we see these stable political relations on display today in Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, Libya, place, and places like that. Journalist named Michael Hirsch, who was uh, one of the big spokesmen for the regime, said United States, he talked about United States primacy in one of his articles. And uh, the translation of that is imperialism, primacy, imperialism. United States primacy is the greatest gift the world has received in many, many centuries, possibly all of recorded history. And then finally, uh, Dick Cheney, the former vice president and American defense secretary, <clears throat> just came out with a, a new book about a month ago. And the title is Exceptional. Uh, and I think the subtitle is something like Why America Must Rule the World or something like that. And here's one from the first page, page one. We are, as a matter of empirical fact and undeniable history, the greatest force for good the world has ever known. Uh, OK, so, and that's, so these are examples of the rhetoric of American imperialism. And all of this, all of this, all of these things by, Link, uh, by uh, you know, Lincoln, Cheney, Bush, Clinton, they were all said in the context 
of proposing to bomb somebody, some war. I, I tell people when you hear these American politicians, when they start quoting Abraham Lincoln, somebody somewhere in the world is going to be bombed. Because <laughs> that's always used as the, the moral authority, you know, the moral authority. In a Wall Street Journal article by Dick Cheney some years ago, uh, he, he advocated the uh, invasion and conquest of uh, Iran, Libya, Syria, Lebanon, and North Korea. And uh, I think the title of the article, this is when Bush was president, was Lincoln and Bush. He, he made the argument in the Wall Street Journal, well, Abe Lincoln would probably, if he was alive today, he would do this. So therefore, it must be the thing to do, of course. And so the rest of my time, I want to spend talking about the history of this idea. Where, where, where does this idea come from uh, in America that, that Americans somehow are the most morally superior people on earth and therefore have a right to rule over the whole planet. Uh, well, this is a very old idea. It comes from the New England Puritans, basically. So it's, it never was all Americans. Uh, it, has, it has a pedigree. And I'm going to quote several of my favorite authors on this. Uh, Clyde Wilson, Forrest MacDonald, who's a well-known American uh, historian, uh, Thomas Fleming, uh, who's not, not the paleoconservative Thomas Fleming, but the famous author uh, of uh, The New Dealer's War and, and 50 other books, and also Murray Rothbard on, on this topic. Uh, Clyde Wilson uh, wrote about this, and he referred to it as the Yankee problem. And, and a Yankee in America is a particular, uh, started out as a particular type of New Englander. It wasn't just somebody who lived in the northern states, the northern part. It was a particular type of person who uh, was dominant in that part of the United States. And here's what Clyde Wilson says. These, these people are that particular ethnic group descended from New Englanders who can easily be recognized by their arrogance, hypocrisy, greed, lack of congeniality, and penchant for ordering other people around. Puritans long ago abandoned anything that might be good in their religion, but have never given up the notion that they are the chosen saints whose mission is to make America and the world into the perfection of their own image. Hillary Rodham Clinton, raised a Northern Methodist in Chicago, is a museum quality specimen of the Yankee. Self-righteous, ruthless, and self-aggrandizing. Then he goes on to say, the Yankee temperament, it should be noted, makes a neat fit with the Stalinism that was brought into the deep north. He's talking about New York City, New England, by later immigrants. And uh, in the 1950s, there were a lot, in New York City, there was sort of a, a communist uh, cult that were known as, uh, uh, there was bread, they were known as the red diaper babies. Their parents were all Stalinists, and that's who he's referring to. Well, Clyde Wilson again, right up to the American Civil War, uh, Northerners who were opposed to the conquest of the South blamed the conflict on fanatical New Englanders out for power and plunder. So there were a lot of people in the Northern states who recognized that these Yankees, so-called, were a problem. And uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson, the American uh, writer, became, says uh, Clyde Wilson, the American philosopher who proclaimed the American to be the new man. This all reminds me of Soviet man during the Cold War. The Russians thought you know, communism would create the, a new, new socialist man. And finally, by uh, Clyde Wilson, anything that stood in the way of American perfection must be eradicated. This includes liquor, tobacco, the Catholic Church, the Masonic Order, meat eating, eating meat and marriage. And, and, so, and, and so what he's referring to is there were cults of these uh, uh, divisions, of these, the so-called Yankees, the New England Yankees, who uh, crusaded against all of these things, you know, vegetarian, and for vegetarianism, against marriage, and, and so forth. Now, <clears throat> Clyde Wilson is not the only one. Forrest MacDonald, like I said, he's very well known, uh, he's retired now, American historian. Uh, the, the National Endowment for the Humanities once gave him the, uh, an award as, as the most prestigious historian in America. So he, he was quite a, um, a renowned American um, uh, academic in his day. And he wrote about the same people He's, uh, and the same idea, this American exceptionalism idea. He said this, the first thing to understand about the Yankee, he is a doctrinal Puritan 
characterized by what William McLaughlin has called pietistic perfectionism. Unlike the Southerner, he is constitutionally incapable of letting things be, of adopting a live and let live attitude. No departure from his version of the truth, and the truth is capitalized, is tolerable. And thus, when he finds himself amid sinners, as he invariably does, he must either purge and purify the community or join with his fellow saints and go into the wilderness and establish a new Jerusalem. Now, the, the Yankees embraced totalitarian republicanism, uh, Forrest MacDonald said, and thought thereby to establish God's kingdom on earth. So man, God needed help from man to establish his kingdom on earth. Men had to do it. Uh, he goes on to say, the Yankees, they're, they're always wrong. And yet they are, are always utterly certain and utterly impervious to argument. Uh, end quote. And this, this passage reminded me of a book by Thomas Sowell called uh, The Vision of the Anointed. And in, in, this, uh, in this book by Thomas Sowell, The Economist, he goes chapter after chapter after chapter uh, has different public policy topics, crime, you know, economic policy, and he does chapter and verse of a particular issues where the the uh, the interventionists, if you will, are wrong. Whether you call them liberals, leftists, whatever you want to call them, they're wrong, and their their policies are proven to be counterproductive for decades and decades. But they never ever admit that they were wrong ever. And that's the theme of Sowell's book, The Vision of the Anointed. And that's also what uh, Forrest MacDonald is referring to here. And he goes on to say, because of this attitude, the Yankee has a great deal of suppressed anger and hostility. But by, by becoming soldiers for Christ and warring against the unregenerated people of the world, they could vent their anger and aggression suppressed for so long. Oliver Cromwell is the Yankee's prototype. Seek the heathen out, give him a chance to save himself by embracing the prevailing truth, and if he rejects the opportunity, then run him through with a bayonet. That's a much more fanciful way of saying that bumper sticker that I alluded to, do as we say or we will bring democracy to your country. Okay, and so, and then he goes on, finally he concludes by saying, uh, the Yankees, so-called, form the backbone of the Republican Party of Abraham Lincoln, and, and ever since, and ever since then, you know, I just quoted Dick Cheney and, and Reagan and these people claiming God has spoken to them and, and told them uh, his purpose. Okay, now Thomas Fleming, he's the author of 50 books, including a, a good anti-war book called The New Dealer's War. And his latest book is called A Disease in the Public Mind, A New Understanding of Why We Fought the Civil War, the American Civil War. And he touched upon this whole, this same thing, this, this, this idea of uh, American exceptionalism and its roots in, in, this, in, in basically New England, uh, the Yankees, so-called Yankees. He said in the 1860s, the, the so-called Yankees were dominated by 25 or so wealthy and influential people who had abandoned Christianity, they condemned Jesus Christ, and in, in, in his place, they embraced uh, a man named John Brown as their savior. Uh, and the, the, I call him the mentally ill John Brown, who declared himself to be a communist. Uh, he, and he adopted a, a mantra that blood must be shed and lots of it to eradicate all sin from America and the world. And so, and of course, John Brown was, became a, a hero to the, uh, uh, the northern side of the American Civil War, as he, he went on sort of a murderous rampage in the state of Kansas. And then uh, he made his way to West Virginia, where he broke into a, uh, he and his band of followers broke into a, uh, an arsenal, a federal government arsenal, to attempt to steal firearms, all in the name of ending slavery. And uh, he was apprehended and hanged uh, eventually. But, uh, but that, that's the sort of thing he was doing. And he's uh, sort of a terrorist. And uh, William Lloyd Garrison was also a famous uh, newspaper editor. He edited the New York Tribune, which is the, the biggest newspaper of the day during this era. He was a follower. He said the prevailing attitude was that these people were inclined to believe in the moral depravity of anyone who disagreed with them. 
Okay. And Thomas Fleming goes on to say that th these people were insanely jealous of Southerners in America who did not go along with their ideology. He said they, they denounced them for decades as, quote, guilty of four unforgivable sins, violence, drunkenness, laziness, and sexual depravity. Uh, he says this was all strikingly familiar to the public frenzy that gripped Massachusetts during the witch trials. These are the same people who, who accused women in, in Massachusetts of being witches and, and tied them down and burned, uh, set them on fire in the, in the, in the 1600s. That's, that's, that's this, where some of these people came from. Uh, and he all, Fleming also writes of the spectacular hypocrisy of the New Englanders who rediscovered the sacred American Union after they tried to secede from the Union in the, after Thomas Jefferson was elected. Now, now moving on to Murray Rothbard. Murray Rothbard wrote about the same phenomenon um, in, in his essay, Just War. Uh, he says, you know, he, he recognized the exact same things, that the North's driving force during this war was the Yankees. So that, that ethno-cultural group who either lived in New England or migrated from there to upstate New York, northern and eastern Ohio, northern Indiana, northern Illinois, uh, in, in the United States, had been swept by a new form of Protestantism. He said this was a, a fanatical and emotional neo-Puritanism driven by a fervent post-millennialism which held that as a precondition for the second advent of Jesus Christ, man must set up a thousand year kingdom of God on earth. So he, he was pretty much saying the same thing that was recognized by Forrest MacDonald and Clyde Wilson, that uh, this attitude was we must, er man must eradicate all sin uh, and because only then can we be saved and go to heaven. And that that's what motivated the, uh, the, the so-called Yankees who waged the American Civil War. And then after the American Civil War, of course, this idea spread to saving the whole world. You know, how, how hypocritical could we be just saving America? You know, how selfish of us to just save America from sin. We must save the whole world from sin. And this, and, uh, and Woodrow Wilson was a pietist, by the way. The man who, who, who inserted the United States into World War I uh, was a part of this tradition. He was a, a, a post-millennialist pietist uh, from, from Virginia. The kingdom, uh, and Murray Rothbard goes on to say, the kingdom is to be a perfect society. In order to be perfect, this kingdom must be free of sin. Sin, therefore, must be stamped out in, as quickly as possible. Moreover, if you don't try your darndest to stamp out sin by force, you yourself will not be saved. It was very clear to these neo-Puritans, uh, Rothbard wrote, that in order to stamp out sin, government in the service of the saints is the essential coercive instrument to perform this purgative task. As historians have summed up the views of all the most prominent of these millennialists, government, it, quote, and he quotes these historians, government is God's major instrument of salvation. And, and so that fits in, doesn't it, with those quotes that I read at the beginning from uh, uh, Cheney and, and Abe Lincoln and, and, uh, and Bush of uh, claiming to know what, uh, what's in God's mind. And this is one of the reasons why uh, the, the American Civil War, these, all these men said, uh, partook of this, this uh, all the massive death and destruction and the, the waging of total war on civilians. The more blood, the better, John Brown said. And then when it was all over, a pietist named Julia Ward Howe wrote a, uh, a song about it, the Battle Hymn of the Republic, and called all the death and destruction the, the glory of the coming of the Lord. You know, mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord is the first, the first words of that song. I remember being forced to sing that every morning in elementary school in, in the state of Pennsylvania where I, where I, where I grew up, uh, is, is even a you know, hundred years after the, the war was over. Another person, who, uh, a very famous author who recognizes this, the roots of this American exceptionalism idea was the author Robert Penn Warren. Now, Robert Penn Warren is, is most, probably most uh, famous for his novel, All the King's Men. He wrote 19 other novels, and in, uh, and in 1960, he was asked to write a book on the legacy of the Civil War, the American Civil War, which he did. And it's a very interesting little book. And the, the main point he makes on this topic in this little book, The Legacy of the Civil War, 
is this. He says, the war left the, the, uh, the, the Yankees, so-called Yankees, with a treasury of virtue. Okay, he says, this is the, and I'm quoting him, this is the psychological heritage left to the North. The Northerner with his treasury of virtue feels redeemed by history. He has in his pocket not a papal indulgence peddled by some wandering pardoner of the Middle Ages, but an indulgence, a plenary indulgence for all sins, past, present, and future. They saved the Union. They ended slavery. Well, everyone else in the world ended slavery, too. The British ended slavery, the Spaniards, the, the French, the Dutch, the Swedes. Uh, but, but only the Americans have some sort of special uh, uh, a favor from God because they eventually did it. Uh, they were the only ones who did it uh, unpeacefully, by the way. Also, the, you know, the, there, was, there was no massive war when, when, the, when Britain ended uh, slavery in the British Empire. Uh, only in America was there a war associated with it. And so uh, Robert Penn Warren goes on to say that this moral narcissism was the justification for the Crusades of 1917 to 1918 and 1941 to 1945. So this moral narcissism that came out of the American Civil War, uh, the Yankee ideology, was uh, the justification for American entry into World War I, and I would argue all other wars, the, all other military interventions to this very day that the, uh, that the U.S. government uh, is, uh, is, has, is involved in and has been involved in. And uh, he also, there's a whole section of the Robert Penn Warren's little book on what must be forgotten. You know, we must forget, forget almost all of real history in order to deify not only Abe Lincoln, but the whole regime that came out of the American Civil War. Uh, I'll just read a little bit of it. It is to be forgotten that the Republican Party platform of 1860 pledged protection to the institution of slavery where it existed and that the Republicans in 1861 were ready to guarantee slavery in the South as a bait to return to the Union. It must also be forgotten that Lincoln, in his 1858 speech, said, quote, I am not or ever have been in favor of bringing about in any way the social and political equality of the white and black races. So you have to forget all of this, not only the rhetoric, but the actions of, of Lincoln himself and the American regime during the Civil War. And you have to believe in this myth uh, that, that has been perpetrated by the American state about the, uh, the deification of the American state. Finally, uh, Robert Penn Warren, goes, uh, he says, Arm, armed with these, these myths, most Americans are, quote, prepared to see the Civil War as the fountainhead of our power and prestige among the nations, among the nations. And uh, when I, when I reread that in preparing this uh, little talk, uh, it reminded me also of when, when Musharraf declared uh, martial law in Pakistan. Who did he quote as justification? Well, Abe Lincoln, of course. He said, Abe Lincoln did it in America during their Civil War. Therefore, it must be morally right for me to, to, uh, to do this. Now, there, there always has been a, what uh, economists call a bootleggers and Baptists connection here. That is, there's the, these, these ideological imperialists, uh, the, what do you call them, Yankees or American exceptionalists or whatever, they've always been joined in with businessmen who saw money in this, okay? And uh, it's called Bootleggers and Baptists by my old friend Bruce Yandel, the economist. Uh, he wrote about uh, alcohol prohibition in America in the 1920s. Uh, the the two, two groups that were for it were bootleggers, people who illegally sold alcohol because they, were, they made money in it. And the Baptists, that was just a, a, a sort of a, a general term to describe religious people who were against to, drinking of alcohol for lit religious re reasons, okay? And so you always had the pietists, these people who wanted to save the world and you know, force our values and everybody else. And then you've got the military industrial complex who, know, who understands there's a lot of money in this. And they've always joined together in the United States. That's why you have people like Reagan and Cheney and Clinton and Bush all quoting, or their speech writers quoting uh, quoting Abe Lincoln and claiming God tells us to, to intervene in the world, you know, we're the biggest force for good and all that. And, and of course, the, uh, the military-industrial complex cheers them on. And so 
among some of the good they've done, uh, the, the, the latest uh, updated research on the American Civil War is that the, the death count uh, may have been as much as 850,000. For 100 years, the historians thought it was 620,000. But the newer forensic research has, uh, has led to our, our understanding that it was as much as 850,000. And this was a time when the population of the United States was about one-tenth of, of what it is today. So if you standardize for today's population, it would be the equivalent of eight and a half million uh, people dying in just under four years in a, in a civil war. And then as soon as the war was over, the US government turned to Indian genocide, which I talked about it here on this stage a few years ago in one of my talks, where uh, in order to make way for the transcontinental railroads, they, they massacred uh, at least 60,000 of the, uh, the American Indians. Uh, and then, then there was the Spanish-American War to civilize the Filipinos by killing them, uh, and the, the conquest of Hawaii, and then the Filipino insurrection where the American military uh, killed at least 200,000 Filipinos in order to give them democracy. And Theodore Roosevelt, the president, Theodore Roosevelt, called the peace advocates, you know, there were, there were many, there was a great opposition to this, of course, but the opposition did not prevail. And uh, Teddy Roosevelt called the peace advocates, quote, senile idiots and unhung traitors. And traitors who had not been hung, hanged, okay? And he warned of what he called the menace of peace. And he said, he also said this, the United States must intervene when a nation failed to behave. Isn't that almost perfectly the same as that bumper sticker I mentioned to do as we say or we will bring democracy to your country? And all of this, of course, is why um, uh, Bill Kristol claims that Teddy Roosevelt is his favorite Republican president in all of history, it's, uh, the, the neocon Bill Kristol. And uh, one other thing that uh, Teddy Roosevelt said was, quote, all the great master races have been fighting races, he, he said. Of course, he never did much fighting himself. He had his picture taken on a horse a few times uh, after the Spanish-American War, but uh, and, and he used to shoot wild game uh, in Africa. But that, that's pretty much uh, uh, he was quite the crazy man. He, uh, uh, when he was president, this is a true story. He would uh, he would get on his horse or at, at daybreak and ride through a neighborhood called Rock Creek Park in Washington, D.C., which is still a park, uh, with a pistol shooting wildly into the air, you know, pretending he was a cowboy. And, and one day, uh, he had somebody put a wire across the Potomac River, and he would grapple his way across the Potomac River. There's the President of the United States at like 6 o'clock in the morning, making his way across this wire across the Potomac River. And when he was asked why he would do such a thing, he said he, he thought his wrists needed strengthening. And uh, it's a tr true story. I, you know, kind of a you know crazy man, uh, elected president, uh, and so the same story. You know, after the Filipino uh, insurrection, World War One, World War Two, Korea, Vietnam, today's Middle East, it's all based on this idea of American exceptionalism, uh, and so, so this is why uh, you know I'm you know I'm working on this book on the political economy of war, and. Um, planning a couple of chapters on the advocates of war, you know, people who use ideology to, to instigate wars, and this is going to be a, a, a part of it. And, and this has been going on for a very long time, and so, uh, and, and of course, this has been noticed by people around the world for a very long time. You know, how could they not know, how could the Filipinos not notice this, or, or all of the victims of American imperialism? And uh, so I'm going to end with a short quote from, by Otto von Bismarck who once said, God has a special providence for fools, drunks, and the United States. I think, I, think, I think these are the people he was referring to. Not all Americans, but, but these people, the Yankees, so-called. And that's my time is up. A half hour is uh, taken up. <laughs>